Hey everybody, welcome to Monster Monday. This a uh, pre-show for Monster Monday. Uh, we're gonna be a couple of minutes late getting started because I was running a little bit late for a number of reasons, and we are listening to music right here from Sirenscape. Um, this is from a sound set in Sirenscape called... Uh, let me pull it up here. Sirenscape is called Music by Tyrone. And uh, Sirenscape has all kinds of great music for your tabletop games. Uh, I chose this one because it's got a variety of music that is good ambient sound for bunch of different kind of uh, tabletop game settings and it's just going to be kind of a music bed in the background once we actually get started with the, with the show but pre-show you have a chance to listen to a little bit of it so this is uh check out sirenscape they're a great platform i've started to use them in my uh, live games and my players they're really enjoying because there's a plugin with Sirenscape built right in the Discord, and you can stream Sirenscape through Discord so that as a DM, I can hear it, my players can hear it, and the stream can hear it. And that's really cool. Alright, uh, and also, as always, a uh, reminder to go over and check out Mo at the Tabletop Bellhop. Mo is the OG when it comes to all things tabletop games, card games, games, party games, you name it, Mo has it. Alright, I'm going to turn the music up a little bit to fix my tea, and then I'll be with you in a moment to start the show. down and welcome 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 everybody to monster monday for monday the 15th of november 2021 i am your host dm galabond and tonight on monster monday we are going to be looking at a creature that is out of the out of the guildmaster's guide to ravnica source book but it doesn't really appear that this specific creature ever appeared in Magic the Gathering. So it's kind of interesting. I wonder if this is one of those creatures they thought about putting in Magic and they didn't. And they had stuck stuck it away in a shelf and then they pulled it out for D&D. Or whether they just thought of something story-wise that they needed in D&D. And they riffed off of some creatures that they do have in Magic the Gathering. And they brought this over to uh, Guildmaster's Guide of Guide to Ravnica. And of course, the creature that I am talking about is the 
Galvanus Weird. Uh, the Galvanus Weird is a creature that is uh, that is from the. Okay, come on. There we go. The Galvanus Weird is a creature that. Um, that is used by the Is It League, and it's classified as an elemental. However, it is created in a similar manner to a construct. So, and when we look at the creature type, we'll see it's an elemental creature, but it also has some of the characteristics and properties of a uh, of a construct. All right, so. What are what is a Galvanus Weird? Well, a, a Galvanus Weird is a part of a group of monsters called Weirds out of Magic the Gathering, specifically out of Ravnica, that are uh, a subspecies of elementals. They're a creature type unique to the Izzet League on Ravnica, and they were built by Ravnican experimenters uh, to be pretty much ubiquitous lab experiment or lab assistants and pets of the uh, members so it's it's kind of a kind of a strange hybrid of a construct and now that particular description of what the weird is comes out of the magic the gathering wiki and what we get from the 5e e uh, the 5e D &D beyond uh, description of the galvanus weird in particular it's got a rigid body of elemental ice with a core of lightning that animates the creature and if a galvanus weird is destroyed the ice shatters and lightning crackles outward in a dangerous explosion now you may be wondering why would we be taking such a niche monster and featuring that niche monster here on Monster Monday. Well, it's that very property that's the reason that we are doing a whole episode on this creature. Because we're going to be talking about monsters that deal damage when they die. That's like the galvanus weird is our portal our entryway into into that whole world of monsters and you'll be surprised at the range of monsters and how far back those monsters go when it comes to monsters that deal damage to other creatures when they actually die so uh, this is uh, what we're going to be talking about. Now, the lore of the Galvanus Weird, uh, and by the way, I should, I should say that this is a picture of the Galvanus Weird from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica Sourcebook uh, from D&D &D 5e. This right here is a picture of another weird that is part of both the card set from Magic the Gathering and the Guildmaster's Guide. This is the Blister Coil Weird. And um, this is also from Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica. Uh, but the lore about the Galvanus Weird is this. Uh, Galvanus Weird seem to be the epitome of weird technology. Indeed, they serve willingly with cheerful stupidity as guardians and laborers in Izzet workshops. Uh, and then lore about weirds in general is that they were created by Niv Mizzet, who's the Isn't League param and guildmaster. Uh, now Niv Mizzet is a creature type. He's like a gigantic uh, dragon uh, that is the guildmaster of the um, of the Isn't League. And he supposedly created this during the Katazar Razblat Elemental Symposium, and so to produce elementals that might be more stable and easier to control. 
So weirds are the semi-sentient walking paradox result of a fusion of elementals of opposing elements, such as fire and water, or earth and electricity. Now that also comes out of the Magic the Gathering wiki. Now, of course, what happens is that when you take inherently opposing uh, elemental uh, elemental elements and you put them together you get something that's inherently more unstable and this is where we're gonna get to when we start talking about how you would use this particular monster in your D&D campaign all right and as I said this is a creature type of an elemental now another type of weird that appears in the D&D Ravnica block is a steam core weird steam core weird is not in D&D and like I said the Galvanus weird itself is not in Magic the Gathering the blister coil weird is in both so um, the steam core weird is a, another weird that's a blue creature that has uh, a mix of blue and red mana uh, or it's a blue mana to cast and red mana to activate it so in D D, the galvanus weird is a uh, it's a property of uh an, or is a is an elemental creature type and elementals are creatures native to the elemental plane. Some creatures of this type are little more than animate masses of their respective elements, including creatures simply called elementals. Others have biological forms infused with elemental energy. Races of genies, including Jinn and Afrit, form the most important civilizations on the elemental planes. And other elemental creatures include Azers, Invisible Stalkers, and Water Weirds. Okay, um, but this is why we say that there's a bit of a property of constructs to the um, to the weirds in Ravnica because they were actually engineered, if you will. So they're engineered out of elemental components, but you take a little bit of the elements from over here, a little bit of the elements over there, you mash them together, you squeeze them around, you make your mud pie with them. There you go. And uh, then when something bad happens to them, they blow up and they damage everybody around them. All right. Uh, okay. Now we are going to get into looking at the mechanical features of the Galvanus weird and similar creatures. So, what is the similarity of these? Well, I've already kind of tipped my hand that the reason we are looking at these is because all of these creatures have the quality that when they uh, when they die or when they reach zero hit points bad things happen to people around them and we can go all the way back to the D&D creature catalog which is from basic edition way back before AD&D first edition came about um, so this is like way back in the early 1980s or late 1970s and we have a creature called the Hupzine. Now, the Hupzine um, is a uh, is a lesser construct animated by a combination of an arcane rituals and cooperation of an inhabitant of the outer planes. Uh, but they have no limbs and bear no physical resemblance to living creatures. They're made in the form of ornaments, pieces of jewelry, or other rich, richly fashioned object. Only means of moving about is by slow magical flight, but they have little need to move since they are normally left as stationary guards of important places. Wherever the Hupzine is left, its form will normally be such as to make it seem innocuous. Um, occasionally people have even been known to use Hupzines as a bodyguard by wearing in the form of an ornate belt, a large amulet, or ring. Um, they are sufficiently intelligent to require only general instructions from their creators, hear sounds, understand common tongue, respond intelligently to changing circumstances, and plan attacks sensibly. Their only attack is by means of magic user spells. Um, 
So each day it can cast as many spells as a magic user same level as it has hit dice. The set of spells available is fixed when it's made and cannot be altered. They are immune to mind affecting spells and non-magical weapons do only half damage against them, but when it's reduced to zero or fewer hit points it explodes, causing 1d6 points of damage plus 2 points per unused spell to anyone within 10 feet. So here's an image of a hub zine as a ring. And so basically what this is, this is a what would a what would amount to anywhere between a CR3 and CR7 monster in the form of a piece of jewelry that you know, if left let's say as part of a cache, it's left in a jewelry box. Somebody comes along that's not the owner and tries to steal it. That piece of jewelry is going to start casting magic user spells at the thief. <laughs> yes. All right. Uh, very, very interesting guardian. And then what's more, if you figure out what is causing, what is casting the nasty spells at you and you destroy it, well, then it's going to blow up and do more damage to you. So... Uh, that is the earliest example of such a creature I could find. But then we have, uh, in first edition, we have the gas spore. And the gas spore is a fungal creature, and it shows up throughout D&D and other types. Uh, and I think it, it's all, 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 the way, all the way in fifth edition. Uh, I think it may be in every edition of the game between first edition and now. And the gas spore is a fungus that from a distance looks like a beholder. Uh, but when it is uh, when it is destroyed, uh, it explodes. And uh, every creature within a 20 foot radius, take 66 damage and if a gas spore makes contact with exposed flesh to, uh, the spore shoots tiny rhizomes into living matter and grows throughout the victim system in one melee round and the um, and the victim must get a cure disease within 24 hours or the victim dies and then out of the victim's corpse will sprout two to eight more gas spores. So uh, that's a pretty nasty uh, creature in that regard. Uh, now also in this particular... Uh, okay, no, not, not in that source, but in this particular edition, in the Monster Manual 2, there are another pair of curious creatures uh, the, that are from the positive and negative material planes. The Zagya and the Zagyi. The Zagya uh, are creatures from the positive material plane. Zagyi are from the negative material plane, much alike being reverse images of each other. Uh, Zagya are silver and fiery. Their touch brings a surge, much like a bolt of lightning. Uh, and then the touch of a black, lifeless Zagyi causes cell death or necrotic damage, you know, that we would call it 5e. Life energy drain of a mild sort and aging and rotting of such materials as are burned by Zagya. Uh, Zagyi send identical tendrils of negative current, which chill metal and inflict damage. Normal metal magical properties and magical metals which have not been saved versus the energy uh, melt are lost. Okay, so uh, that is a um, that is a pretty nasty creature. And then slaying creature of either type releases a burst of energy or negative force within a 10 foot radius. Uh, this release inflicts double damage. Um, 14 to 24 on all victims within its area of effect and saving throws must be made as if it had a uh, as if a bolt had actually touched off the affected creatures Zagya and Zagyi should ever meet they will 
rush together and destroy each other in a huge 30 foot radius explosion, which loses 28 to 48 points of damage. 4d6 plus 24. Uh, so only magic weapons will affect these creatures. So yeah, that's a really interesting and weird and crazy creature. But, you know, it's like, in some ways, in some ways, people thought a lot more outside the box in uh, older editions of the game. And, you know, you had just the freedom to basically imagine creatures from anywhere. And so here's a couple, here's a couple of great examples of that. Um, and we get the picture of one of these and yeah, I guess you just imagine the negative image of this and that would be the other creature. All right. So then in second edition, we once again have the gas for, which is listed uh, along with the fungi in the uh, in the monster manual. And then we also have, as part of the tannery, we have the Baylor. Now the Baylor is a um, is a type of demon. So the uh, greatest and most terrible of the true Tanari, the Baylors are undisputed terrors of the abyss. The very motivations behind the Tanari involvement in the Blood War, and um, they are—they have armor class of negative eight, which means they're practically impossible to hit. Their special defenses are you have to have a plus three magic weapon or better to hit them. If you have a plain old plus one or plus two magic weapon, they're completely immune to it. Um, and then they have a really nasty effect if they wind up getting uh, killed. So if a Baylor is slain in the abyss, it explodes in a blinding flash of light, inflicting 50 points of damage to everything in a 100 foot radius around the creature. Uh, so saving throw versus spells for half. So that would be uh, one of the more powerful versions of one of these creatures that deals damage when it explodes. Now, up until this time, they all the way through second edition, I believe, they didn't really have a name for this effect. So you'll find that all of these different creatures that have this effect, they just it's described in much the similar, much the similar way, but something bad happens when they uh, when they die and it explodes and it has some kind of negative effect. All right, so another second edition monster of this type is a Gore Bell. Uh, Gore Bell has an armor class of three, two hit dice. Uh, it basically looks very similar to a walking uh, stubby two-legged uh, beholder it has these eye stalks and everything um, and they attack and eat practically anything that moves and only their explosive nature keeps them from over overrunning their um, habitat so in combat um, uh, a hit with a blunt weapon merely bounces off the Gorbel's rubbery hide, but a successful hit with a piercing or slashing weapon bursts the Gorbel's balloon-like body. A cloud of pyrophoric gas is thus released, and it explodes for 1d4 points of blast damage to any creature within 5 feet. Uh, magically incurred damage will also cause the creature to explode regardless of the damage actually inflicted. Um, and Gorbels are not immune to the explosions of their herd mates within range. Um, so entire herds have been known to be to destroy themselves accidentally in a chain reaction explosion caused by damage to a single creature. So yes, there are 
there is a sense of humor with some of these creatures and that is definitely one reason that you might use them in your campaigns is if you want to have if you want to have something that is both terrifying and a little bit funny for your players um you know you can just imagine a whole herd of these things running along and somebody defensively slashes one with a sword and then they all <laughs> they all blow up <laughs> and if the party is right in the middle of the herd well then they take a bunch of damage because all these things blow up around them. so that's uh that's something to look forward to all right then you know we go to some of the other settings and of course dark sun setting is famous for having a bunch of really weird um weird creatures and the para the sun para elemental beast is one such creature it is a has armor class two nine hit dice and it um, it's a creature that can be summoned um, in dark sun basically there's no deities the people that have any kind of spiritual belief basically worship elemental uh, forces and so if you summon creatures in the way that a cleric might might summon a, a celestial helper what you wind up getting is you wind up getting a an elemental beast um, and they um, they can create massive uh, bursts of sunlight from their bodies that blind any seeing uh, opponent within 150 foot radius all undead uh, suffer damage and then they are oh okay let's see da, 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 da. when okay uh when they reach zero hit points they explode into solar energy producing the same effect as this power so uh they have the ability to um siphon off some of their hit points to create these effects from time to time during a combat and then if they are ever reduced to zero hit points it also um, does this bursting sunlight that blinds any seeing opponent within a 150 foot radius unless they make a save versus spells so this one doesn't deal damage unless it unless the damage is to undead but it will blind other seeing creatures so that's another important factor to think about is some of these things that happen when something dies and explodes you don't have to have it deal damage it can create a either a hazardous condition or a debilitating condition for the pcs that requires a saving throw and on a failed save now there's consequences that uh, might happen then we have the floater which is also out of the dark sun uh, milieu and the floater is a basically it's a desert jellyfish it's a big jellyfish that is in the silt seas area and uh, they are large creatures that are kept aloft by um, by their bodies being filled with hydrogen gas and so naturally when they die they blow up and um, let's see they uh, do, 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 do. because they're hydrogen gas they're especially susceptible to flame attacks any susceptible flame attack made against the floater does four times normal damage so a 75 percent chance to cause the creature to explode into flames engaged in melee when it explodes the floater's opponent suffers 1d8 points of damage and um, and then to make to make matters even worse because it's dark sun these floaters these jellyfish actually have psionic abilities so they can attack you with psionics 
including attacking you with poison tentacles and blowing up and dealing fire damage to you when they die. So you got that look to look forward to if you fight any of those. All right, let's see. I think that's all out of that particular source. Yes, okay, so now we go into 3rd edition. And 3rd edition is where we begin to start to standardize. And it's still not completely standardized in 3rd edition or 4th edition, or even 5th edition for that matter, which is a little bit disappointing. But they have now come up with the with the uh, concepts of either death throws or a death burst. Now, death throws are thinking of those as perhaps a longer lasting effect or a more nuanced effect. Death burst is definitely when the physical form or the corpse or the um, ectoplasmic structure of the creature explodes and has an explosive effect like that. So for death throws for the Baylor in third edition, uh, it explodes in a blinding flash of light that deals 100 points of damage to anything within 100 feet. Uh, re reflex save DC 30 for half damage. This explosion automatically destroys any weapon the Baylor is holding and the save is uh, constitution based. So, um, and then let's see, what else is in this particular, okay, uh, there's not anything in that source, but then we have in the, oh, uh, in this, uh, in the Monster Manual 2, we have something called the Ether Scarab. And the Ether Scarab is a uh, very uh, ornate looking, almost bejeweled looking uh, creature. Not quite like an insect, but it is, uh, it's a, let's see, I think it's a tiny little creature. And, um, the panicky, harmless-looking beetles are native to the ethereal plane. A wide variety of ethereal predators eat their scarabs, uh, eat ether scarabs, so the latter have developed the ability to flee across planar boundaries. And the scarab has six tentacle-like legs and a hard amethyst vein chitinous shell marked by swirling, colorful patterns. And then uh, it has this death burst uh, capability. So an ether scarab that dies on the material plane explodes harmlessly, causing a planar rip. Between the material plane and the ethereal plane, this hole in the fabric lasts 1d4 plus 1 rounds. So now by ripping the planar fabric with its mandibles, an ether scarab can create a two-way portal between its own plane and another. And this hole appears tiny, but can accommodate any large or smaller creatures traveling in either direction. A planar rip closes there. So, this is yet another effect that you can have. If you decide that you want to have a creature that is from a different plane, you can have it... Uh, you can put sort of a death burst or death throws... Uh, feature on that monster so that when it explodes when it dies it creates a portal between the uh, material plane and whatever plane the monster is native to all right and then let's see in fourth edition I think yeah that was all so in fourth edition in the monster manual we have our old friend the Baylor who uh, obviously we know it's got the death burst and uh, close burst uh, 10 squares so that's out to 50 feet plus 29 versus reflex 70 10 fire damage and the Baylor and its weapons are completely destroyed in that burst also in this same uh, in 
this same resource. We have the uh, stone golem. Uh, let's see, there's one. The stone golem uh, explodes in a shard of jagged stones and shrapnel uh, that will uh, destroy or damage other creatures around it. Then there's a corruption corpse on page, and there's actually several of these different types of zombies that will explode uh, when they hit uh, zero hit points. So the corruption corpse is a level four uh, zombie, and it's got the death burst when it when it explodes. Close burst one. Plus seven versus fortitude, it deals 2d6 plus three necrotic damage. Then uh, on the uh, very next page, we have the Chillborn Zombie, which has Death Burst, and it's a level six soldier, plus nine versus fortitude, and it explodes for 2d6 plus two cold damage and the target is slowed. And then there's the, uh, let's see, whoops. Uh, I thought there was another one there. No, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's in the next source book. We have the Angel of Light. Uh, the Angel of Light is a level 23 minion skirmisher. So when the Angel of Light drops to zero hit points, uh, it explodes in a burst of radiant light, close burst 10, so again, out to 50 feet, uh, targets enemies plus 26 versus fortitude, and angels within that burst gain 10 temporary hit points. So it doesn't deal damage, but it, it grants a boon to its allies. So now that's kind of a sacrificial type of uh, death effect. And uh, I used something like that in, I used something like that in an encounter in uh, the Innistrad plane when I had my homebrew uh, Walker of Waterdeep campaign when they were in that plane they were fighting some undead and when those undead died they exploded and it uh no i'm sorry they did not explode but when they died it actually gave a boon to their allies um, so i didn't use the actual death burst feature but i used uh something because those were creatures that came out of Magic Gathering, and there was some text on the card that says when this, when this creature leaves play, other creatures of its kind gain like plus one, plus one, or something like that. So, translating that to D&D is that when they, um, when one of these creatures died, the other one got, I think it was like plus one to their attack rolls or something like that. So it was a minor, it was a minor uh, gain, but you could see how if you had a lot of those on the battlefield, the more of them that die, the, hard, the harder and harder the uh, other ones that are left will hit. So it's kind of a way of ratcheting up your uh, attacks but in this case it's just giving temporary hit points to uh, another creature so that's the angel of light then from the same resource there is a creature called i believe the i believe the name for it is the foria or the fair the pharah the pharah okay uh the pharah has a death burst. Um, they're bird-like creatures that fly through the skies of the elemental chaos. And um, so 
they uh, have a close burst out in 10 feet. They deal 3d8 plus 5 fire damage, and it creates a zone of fire that lasts until the end of the encounter. Each creature that enters the zone start, or starts its turn there takes 5 fire damage. So that's a level 12 uh, skirmisher creature. Then, let's see, there's uh, also the Blade Rager Troll from this same source. And the Blade Rager Troll uh, is a level 12 brute. And when the Blade Rager Troll finally drops to zero hit points, it explodes in a burst of shrapnel, close burst uh, two, so out to 10 feet, plus 13 versus reflex, and 2d6 plus five uh, damage. So that is uh, another kind of creature. So you can see that these creatures that have this feature, this death burst feature, they are all over the place. And uh, when I, you know, when it, this particular monster came up in the rotation, I figured, yeah, this is such a small niche creature. How can I make a full episode of Monster Monday out of this? And I thought, oh, this has got this really cool feature. Let's see what other monsters out there have this feature and how that might work into the story that you might tell not only with this monster, but by you guys then understanding that these other monsters exist out there, you can think of, okay, what's the similar story for these other monsters, how you would fit them into your campaign. And then in the Monster Manual 3 from 4th edition, we have the Ghast. And the Ghast, of course, is a kind of undead. Uh, death Burst, Close Burst 2, uh, and it affects living creatures in the burst, plus 9 versus fortitude. And it deals 1d12 plus 5 necrotic damage and ongoing 5 necrotic damage save ends. So, the uh, death burst for these ghasts is a pretty, uh, a pretty nasty uh, ongoing effect. Alright, now we get to 5th edition. And in 5th edition, there is one class of very small, very annoying, and almost innocuous creatures that all have the death burst uh, feature. And they are the methods. So I'm only going to look at one of them because they all do very similar things. And you guys can look up all of the other different types of methods. The steam method, the fire method the uh, you know whatever the other methods are that are out there so the uh, the death burst when the method dies it explodes in a uh, burst of dust each creature within five feet must then succeed on a dc 10 constitution saving throw or be blinded for one minute and a blinded creature can repeat the saving throw on each of its turns and in the effect of itself on its success so in some cases, the effect of the um, death burst of the methods is to cause a hazard or cause a debilitating effect on the party. In other cases, other ones, when they explode, they actually deal damage. Like I think the steam method and the fire method actually deal uh, fire damage. when they explode. All right. Then there's another elemental creature called the Magman. And the Magman also has a death burst. When it dies, it explodes in a burst of fire and magma. Each creature within 10 feet makes a DC 11 deck save, taking 2d6 fire damage on a uh, failed save or half as much on a successful one. Flammable objects that aren't being worn or carried in that area are ignited. And again, uh, the Mephits and the Mephit was a challenge rating one half, and the Magman is also a challenge rating one half. So it's a, a small creature that you would use at low level. Then, from the relatively new, or actually the brand new, uh, Fisman's Treasury of Dragons. 
there's a number of the draconian creatures and again draconians are uh, creatures that come to D&D out of the lore of the uh, Dragonlance setting uh, they are armies that were built by um, the aspect of Tiamat that's in that particular uh, setting as one of the major deities and the um, some of the draconians have either the death throes or the death burst and the draconian dreadnought has the death throes when it's reduced to zero hit points it bursts into flame and is reduced to ashes every creature in a 10 foot radius sphere centered on the draconian must succeed on a dc 13 save or take 10 or 3d6 fire damage and that's a cr4 monster so the draconian dreadnought is cr4 the foot soldier is a CR one half, and it explodes, and uh, everything within five feet uh, must make a DC eleven con save or be restrained as it begins to turn to stone. So the restrained creature must be repeated on a, must repeat the saving throw at the end of its next turn. On a success, the effect ends. Otherwise, the creature is petrified for one minute. Uh, after one minute, the body of the draconian crumbles to dust. So, uh, this is one where it can... Uh, it will basically freeze, some, freeze enemies in place for a minute if they fail their saving throw. Now, it's not a huge saving throw, DC 11... But for a low-level party, that could be a very debilitating, uh, debilitating thing because it might give other enemies time to uh, capture them, tie them up, or if they're those kind of enemies, just go ahead and kill them. Uh, all right, then we have the Draconian Infiltrator, which is a CR3. And when that one is uh, reduced to zero, it turns to a puddle of acid and splashes acid on those around it. So every creature within five feet must make a DC 12 dex save or be covered in acid for one minute. And a creature can use its action to scrape or wash the acid off itself or another creature. And it takes uh, a creature covered in the acid takes two D6 acid damage at the start of each of its turns. So you don't get ongoing saves, but you do have to spend an action to remove that acid uh, from yourself or from others. Um, so if you fail that initial save. And then we have the Draconian Mage. Uh, CR2 monster, Death Throes. Uh, when it's reduced to zero hit points, its scales and flesh immediately shrivel away and its bones explode. Uh, each creature within 10 feet must succeed on a DC 10 deck save or take 2d8 force damage from the exploding skeleton of the uh, Draconian Mage. Uh, then we have the Draconian Mastermind, which is a CR6 monster. And when that one is reduced to zero hit points, Magical Essence lashes out as a ball of lightning at the closest creature within 30 feet before arcing out to up to two other creatures, so basically a chain lightning type effect. Uh, each creature must make DC 14. On a failed save, they take 2d8 lightning damage and they're stunned until the end of the, of the creature's next turn. And on a successful save, it takes half damage and is not stunned. All right, and then we get to the blister coil weird. So, uh, Blister Coil Weird is a uh, is a weird. Now, the interesting thing about this weird, and the reason I included it, is because it bucks the trend. The Blister Coil Weird does not have this uh, uh, does not have the Death Throws thing, but the um, Blister Coil Weird has a slightly different, uh, slightly different property to it. 
where its size will increase if it gets into an area of flame. So if it takes damage from a spell or other magical effect, the size increases by one category. If there isn't enough room, uh, it attains maximum possible size in the space available. While the weird is larger or bigger, it makes strength checks and saving throws an advantage. And if it starts its turn at gargantuan size, it releases energy in an explosion. So each creature within 30 feet must make a DC 12 or take 8d6 fire damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. The explosion ignites flammable objects in the area that aren't being worn or carried and the weird size then returns to medium. So that's a very strange uh, property, a weird property of a weird. And now our dear friend, the Galvanus weird, it's a, it's a very um, low level monster, only a CR1 monster. Uh, armor class 12, 22 hit points, and it's got that death burst. When it, when it dies, it explodes in a burst of ice and lightning. So every creature within 10 feet must make a DC 13 dex save or take seven or 2d6 lightning damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. And then its attacks are its slams. And then, of course, we have our old friend that's been around in every edition, the Gas Boar. Uh, and we have a Stone Melder, which is a creature out of the um, out of the Prince of the Apocalypse adventure. So when the Stone Melder dies, it turns to stone and explodes in a burst of rock shards, becoming a smoking pile of rubble. Every creature within 10 feet must make a DC 14. Uh, deck save taking 2d10 bludgeoning damage on a failed save or half as much now they don't show an image of it here in D&D Beyond so I went out and looked for some artwork and uh, this is an image of the uh, stone melder that is basically fan art so uh, that's not a canon uh, version but it's a uh, one fan's version of what it looks like and then of course we also have the gauth the gauth is another beholder kin and this one is from volo's guide to monsters where it talks about all of the uh, different beholder kin and the gauth has this death throw abilities the magical energy within the Within it explodes, and each creature within 10 feet must make a de DC 14 dex save, taking 3d8 force damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. And the Gauth is a CR6 monster. Alright, so that is a look at, um, I would say probably most of the creatures in the, throughout D&D lore or most of the official creatures that have this quality of when they die they explode or they burst or something else happens and it either deals damage or it causes a negative effect for everybody in the area all right so now we're going to go back to looking at specifically the Galvanus weird and how might we use those in an encounter so the Galvanus weird is just a CR1 monster so it's already a, an easy encounter if you throw one Galvanus weird uh, against a level one party so if we want to keep this within the Ravnica setting and more specifically within the monsters that are tagged with the Is It League, you can create a hard encounter with a Galvanus Weird for a level one party by adding a single source Scorchbringer Guard. For a level two party, it becomes a trivial encounter, and you can add a second Galvanus Weird to make it a hard encounter. And for a level three party, it's also a trivial encounter by itself. And you can add a blister coil weird, which is a uh, slightly 
well, higher level CR monster uh, to the encounter to make it a hard encounter for a level 3 party. Alright, now if you wind up facing a Galvanus Weird as players, you want to keep your distance. Uh, it's not particularly tough, only AC 12, but it's vol volatile structure, frozen elemental water exoskeleton over a core of living elemental lightning means it has a nasty surprise when it drops to zero hit points, it explodes, everything within 10 feet takes damage from the discharge of electrical energy and the flying chunks of ice. Uh, so use your magic weapons or spells because the Galvanus Weird is resistant to non-magical attacks and it's immune to most physical conditions that enemies can inflict upon it. Uh, once again, that is one of the reasons, one of the characteristics that it inherits from sort of its, its quasi-construct nature is it's immune to almost all of the same things that uh, that uh, are the same types of conditions and everything that a construct is being to. Alright, now if you're a DM and you want to use a Galvanus Weird, uh, how might you use it in your in an encounter or in a campaign? So, in an encounter, low-level monsters, weirds could be in sufficient numbers to challenge for a low-level party, or they could represent a mere speed bump or a way to drain spells or healing resources from a higher level party. Uh, Semi-sentient creatures, they'll follow their instructions to the bitter end, which could include explosive results against intruders or a party that are perceived as intruders by the weirds and or their masters. So sending some of these monsters in as a first wave of attackers can result in some additional damage to a party by virtue of their death burst ability. All right, so where would you put these in a campaign? So all of the weirds that appear in D&D are Arcana, Ele Arcana Elemental creations of the Izzet League. That means you'll most often find them in Ravnica or in any other plane where the Izzet League experimenters may have set up an outpost. So imagine, if you will, the party is sent to check on a group of Izzet League researchers who were overdue to check in from their outpost on a world that has unstable portals to the elemental planes. So when they get there, they may find uh, that some rift between the planes has caused the population of weirds to rise dramatically and the researchers are now trapped in their own lab. So can the party find a way to deactivate the weirds safely or can they destroy enough of them so the researchers can be rescued? Uh, that's kind of a way where, yeah, these things are semi-sentient. They're mashups of different elemental uh, components put together. So maybe if you get them too close to a rift to the elemental planes, they just start you know spontaneously multiplying and you get more and more of them and it kind of becomes like the old classic uh, uh, the original uh, Walt Disney Fantasia where Mickey Mouse cuts the you know he's the wizard's apprentice and he uh, animates the broom and uh, the broom starts bringing too much water and so he cuts the broom and then all it does is makes more and more brooms, which just brings more and more water and gets him in more and more trouble. So uh, that, you know, that could be a thing. And then the party are the people that are sent in that have to deal with that. So uh, you might put, you might say in your world or in that particular area that there's like some sort of uh, a trick to deactivating the weirds so that you can maybe turn off that feature so that you don't have a TPK on your hands because they have to fight 20 of these weirds and they all explode um, and deal damage to people. You know, something like that. Now, reskinning the monsters. We've already seen that what is now called either Death Rose or Death Burst feature 
has been around D&D for a long time and it and it runs the gamut everything from super powerful high level uh, demonic creatures all the way down to little mundane uh, creatures that are less than when you know uh, less than a CR1 power so and the whole spectrum in between you, know, you have undead that have this feature you have draconic draconic uh, uh, enemies you've got uh, fungi and then the actual effect of this explosion is everything from disease or debilitating feature to uh, death uh, and damage of different types so obviously Tonight's focus is on that feature of monsters that that have this uh, effect when they die. Uh, you could really have a lot of fun with that in your game. So if you want to change things up, you could reskin these as other kinds of monsters that explode to apply conditions. So maybe when they explode, they blind people, or they paralyze, or they poison, or they knock people prone, or something like that. Alternately, they might apply some other kind of random effect. So uh, you saw how some of them were sacrificial and they gave boons to their allies. Well, what if they had some kind of a weird randomized blink dog effect so that when they die, if you're in melee with it, it randomly uh, teleports you in a, a random direction you know one to six squares so five to thirty feet and then you know that might that might teleport you right next to a big powerful enemy that's on the battlefield or it might teleport you if you're fighting like on a balcony or something might teleport you off the balcony right into midair and then you take falling damage uh, unless you have something like a feather fall spell or something so it, you could do some really weird, strange things like that. Uh, or you could turn them both into a combat and puzzle encounter by creating a specific way to nullify the death burst feature altogether if the PCs are clever enough to figure it out. So uh, that would be a case of like, maybe somebody is uh, creating uh you know if you want to if you want to rip something from the headlines not to be too grim but somebody is making quasi elemental quasi construct versions of like uh suicide bombers that and you stumble onto the warehouse where all or the factory floor where all these things are being made and they're all being stored now you start destroying them they're all going to explode and if you're in there when they explode you're going to be taking a whole lot of damage but maybe there's actually a way to nullify that and maybe if your party is really clever and you don't want your big bad enemy organization to know that they're um uh, you know their diabolical creations have been tampered with you can find a way of just simply deactivating that feature and then they can send those things out uh, as constructs and have them go wherever they're gonna go and then they're so then they do whatever they're going to do to self-destruct and when they do they just fall over and they don't blow up and they don't cause any damage to anybody so uh, that could be a um, that could be uh, something that you could that you could do. So uh, lots of different possibilities. You can you can come up with all kinds of different things to suit whatever the tone and the temperament and the theme of your campaign is. There's bound to be a monster in here. Um, that can work and like we've seen since it goes from like these super powerful demonic lords like Baylors, all the way down to these little 
CR1, CR1 half creatures, you can really put this, uh, have this face any party of any level at uh, any tier of play. So that is our discussion of uh, Galvanus Weirds and more properly um, our discussion of creatures that have the death throws or death burst uh, feature uh, in them throughout the history of the game. All right, I am looking at the chat, and at the moment I don't see any questions, but I am going to go on into the wrap-up, and then I will come back and see if anybody has any questions on this feature or wants to know anything more about the Galvan Galvanus Weird in particular that we didn't talk about. Uh, all right, well, I have been DM Galabond, and this has been Monster Monday for November 15th. We have been talking about the Galvanus Weird tonight. Uh, normally, throughout the week, I have uh, four total streams. I have this Monster Monday and three live play sessions that I do. Sunday afternoons, we are back with our Walker of Waterdeep game. Uh, we resumed that yesterday. The uh, party is in a plane that is based on the Magic the Gathering expansion Arabian Nights. So it is a desert world. And the setting for that desert world is a setting that, or the mechanics of that setting are actually drawn from a D&D &D setting that was also on a desert planet. Uh, then on Thursday night, we have the Sword Coast Chronicles, which is a fifth edition uh, sort of love letter to the published campaigns. We're telling a homebrew story, but we're telling that story through the lens of uh, dipping into and out of fifth edition uh, published campaigns from Wizards of the Coast. Right now we are in the uh, Storm King Thunder storyline and that's going along. Uh, they are in the process of trying to locate and rescue King Hecaton, the Storm Giant King. Uh, then on Saturday nights at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, we are playing a second edition D&D uh, &D game called, uh, that I call Saturday Night Greyhawk. We are right now doing the original Temple of Elemental Evil, and that campaign is uh, using second edition D&D &D rules. So we're having a lot of fun with that, and this campaign is going to be kind of a greatest hits of some of the classic second edition and first edition and uh, basic edition uh, modules, but all tuned for second edition rules. All right, so you can find everything that we do, all of our live streams are simulcast on both Twitch and on YouTube. And all of the archives are over on the YouTube channel. We do have a Patreon there, and I just had a really good idea that I picked up from another creator about ways that I can do more with that Patreon. So uh, hopefully look for later this month some more content going up on the Patreon there. All right, and then next week on Monster Monday, we will be back and we will be doing the, we will be looking at the Screaming Devilkin. So remember that you uh, always do have the option. You can go to the uh, YouTube, you can leave comments on uh, videos. If there's a monster that you want us to do, you can uh, go ahead and do that. And also we do have a Discord server. You can join the Discord and you can request a monster that we do on Monster Monday there. That's all free to join and everything like that. And myself and the players in all of my games are part of that Discord community as well. So we'd love to have you there. All right, so let me go back and take a look at the chat and see if we have any questions. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, I appreciate you guys coming and hanging out. Hope that 
you enjoyed this. I hope that you will join us again for uh, more Monster Monday and more of our streams uh, that we do during the week. Uh, go ahead and drop by for some of our live play games. Uh, I'd love to see you there, and I know the players would love to see you there as well. All right, everybody, take care. Have a wonderful week. And as always, watch out for the monsters under the bed. Good night, everybody.